This is an actual, real life, almost ready to buy mini LED gaming monitor. It's honestly incredible, it's vibrant and blindingly bright, this is only 75% of SDR brightness, it's remarkably fast and responsive, but it's unusable, at least for me. This is the AOC AG274QXM, a 1440p 170Hz IPS gaming monitor with a mini LED backlight, also has adaptive sync, both AMD FreeSync Premium Pro and uh, G-Sync compatible support listed, uh, HDR1000, 10-bit color, and a thousand pound price tag, and a few key flaws that I just cannot understand why they're here. Let me explain. On paper, this thing looks like the absolute best thing around, especially for gaming. Sure, it's only 170 hertz, not 240, but personally, that's a trade-off that I'm more than happy or willing to make for everything else that this thing is rocking. It's a 27-inch 1440p panel, which is my personal preference. It's also an IPS LCD layer over top of the 576 zones of mini-LED backlighting. It sports not only 10-bit color, but is also quoted as covering 155% of the sRGB color space, 116% of the DCI-P3 space, and 125% of the Adobe RGB spectrum, which is no mean feat. They report an SDR brightness of 600 nits, and with HDR1000 supports, that means you have a peak brightness of up to 1000 nits when using HDR, and even a 1 millisecond greater gray response time. Hell, even the I.O. is packed with two HDMI 2.0, uh, sorry, 2.1, apparently HDMI 2.0 just doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, uh, two of those HDMI ports, uh, one DisplayPort 1.4 port, and a USB-C port that actually works in conjunction with the USB 3.2 Gen 1 hub that's built in to offer a KVM switch so that you can hook up, say, uh, your, your work laptop or whatever else via the USB-C cable, uh, and then plug in your gaming PC, your console or whatever to HDMI or DisplayPort, plug your peripherals into the hub, and then you can switch not only the display but also your peripherals between your machines easily. In fact, the Type-C port even offers up to 65 watts of power delivery to charge your laptop or whatever else while in use. That does mean that the power brick is absolutely massive. It's actually rated for 330 watts, which is rather strange as the monitor itself is only rated for 65 watts of typical power consumption, and even adding the 65 watts of USB-C charging and reasonable headroom for both, well, a much smaller, even 200 watt unit would probably still be overkill. With that said, I actually measured this uh, drawing around about 90 watts of power from the wall in, uh, in SDR, but with 100% brightness, so perhaps that larger supply is warranted. Unfortunately, those on-paper highlights are somewhat overshadowed by some glaring issues. Anyone sensitive to flashing lights should probably stop watching now, because one of the biggest issues for me is this. What you're seeing is the mini LED backlight being switched on and off 2,000 times per second. It's illustrated nicely by my response time tool measurements, where you can see just how insane the light output is from this monitor. For reference, here's what a normal graph should look like. See, a, a nice smooth line, bit of noise in there, but that's okay. And now back to the madness. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of a big deal. That alone is enough to make this monitor unusable for me. This is basically the, the same sort of thing you get with ULMB or Ultra Low Motion Blur, where they're effectively inserting a, a black frame every half a millisecond, and that's effectively flicker. That gives me pretty bad both eye strain and a headache almost immediately, and if I'm being honest, I struggled to use this display for more than 10 or 15 minutes at a time. Sadly, this isn't something that you can disable, at least for now, as apparently AOC are working on a firmware update that may allow you to, to do that, but, well, it's not here yet anyway. Now, I actually reached out to AOC about this, this issue uh, before publication of this review, and strangely, their product manager blamed the backlight strobing 
on local dimming. The exact quote I got was, his initial reply was that it is not possible to turn off the local dimming. Therefore, the monitor's backlights will be constantly strobing to display the image. Here's the thing though. This monitor doesn't do local dimming unless you're in HDR mode in the Windows display settings. All of the footage you've seen, the test results you've seen, have all been in SDR standard dynamic range which means that, at least as far as I can tell, the statement I was given at very least just isn't correct, as the local dimming literally isn't enabled. I honestly don't know why the monitor is, is actually doing this, but please AOC, make it stop. Now, your ears might have pricked up at the sound of no local dimming in SDR mode. And uh, yeah, that's true. Um, here is a perfectly black screen in SDR mode, with a bit of backlight bleed, no less. Uh, and here's the same image, but with HDR enabled. That's a pretty big difference, huh? Luckily, it's not something that I'm too worried about, as the 576 local dimming zones, well, that means that with a 27 inch display, each zone is around about two centimeters squared. And if something is actually on the border between zones, then you can actually have, well, a four by four centimeter halo around something as small as your cursor. Now, that haloing isn't something that you would generally notice too much in sort of regular content. Although, strangely, when enabling HDR, the image gained a sort of strange, over sharpened look further driving me away from ever wanting to use HDR, at least on a PC in general. Uh, and on top of that, well, it's just, it didn't end up being a, a very nice experience for me, at least personally. Now, one of the monitor's strongest suits has to be with colors and brightness, as even my Datacolor Spider X, which is woefully underprepared for this level of gamut coverage, well, it's still reported, I think the widest range I've tested, at least, uh, especially on a desktop monitor, it reported a maximum of 650 nits in any of the, the gaming modes, or actually 750 nits in the standard mode with the, the gaming profiles set to off in SDR as well. That's actually pretty significantly higher than AOC's 600 nit claim, and certainly bright enough to, to burn your retinas off. Contrast ratio is pretty lackluster though, at least in SDR, with between 900 to one and 1000 to one in, like I said, in SDR mode. It's only sort of that high thanks to its impressive peak brightness level though, not the, the deep blacks. Of course, when local dimming is enabled, you effectively get a sort of infinite contrast ratio, but since that's locked to HDR only, you won't always be, well, seeing that benefit. If you do end up with one of these though, you should know about the gamma settings. You have three options, uh, gamma one, gamma two, or gamma three. Descriptive, I know, but well, it actually gets worse than that because when in the, the, the gamer mode, the, the game profiles, the Gamma 1 option seems to provide roughly Gamma 2.2, but with the, the gamer mode set to off and just the standard eco brightness mode, well, that, that Gamma 1 setting seems to provide more like Gamma 2.0 instead of 2.2. The Gamma 2 setting provides roughly uh, 1.8, and the Gamma 3 setting, again, in the standard mode, provides the more standard 2.2. To my eyes, either gamma one or three settings, depending on if you're in a game mode or not, uh, are the best of visual uh, settings. So that's what I would pick if you do end up with one of these. When it comes to response time, AOC's claim that this is a, a one millisecond monitor is actually pretty hard to prove. Looking at a thousand FPS footage of the, the UFO test, it sure doesn't seem like it, as even with the, the brightness changes, with overdrive off anyway, it looks like it takes around sort of four milliseconds from the, the first sort of uh, image of the, the new frame being shown to it being fully rendered and crisp. 
using my response time tool, trying to pick where the transition starts and ends here is uh, basically impossible, at least within a, a pretty wide margin of error. If you use an absolutely insane 120 point moving average, you do end up with at least somewhat of a usable line to at least look at. And well, for this mid gray transition, it's right around four milliseconds. The, the brighter uh, sort of falling transition is actually more like five milliseconds and white to black is more like 3.7. Although, admittedly, full black to full white, or RGB 0 to 255, is right around one millisecond. So technically, this can count as a one millisecond monitor, but you won't be feeling that. Of course, that is with the overdrive modes turned off. So is it any better with it on its maximum strong setting? Well, yes, 0 to 255 takes just 0 0.7 milliseconds. Uh, although, well, somewhat strangely, 255 to zero is actually slower at more like 4.5 milliseconds and you get pretty bad overshoot with anything that isn't the extremes. RGB 51 to 102 spikes to 25% higher than the, the end of average light level and 153 to 102, well that visits the Laurentian Abyss with an average 62% undershoot. Yikes. That almost means that it takes around 12 milliseconds or two full frames for the pixels to stop transitioning. That's kind of, well, far from great. The medium overdrive setting is a little less aggressive, but still doesn't really speed things up much. Actually, on average, it ends up being longer thanks to the slight under and overshoots. Uh, so only the, the weak overdrive setting is actually worth enabling if at all, although actually of all of the measurements that I, I calculated, the offsetting ended up being the most consistently fast, so I'll leave that one up to you. When it comes to input lag, every tool I used here really struggled with this. My time sleuth reported anywhere between 1.8 and 2.8 milliseconds, which to be clear is still a, a good result, but that level of variability, especially from the time sleuth, is pretty rare to see. NVIDIA's LDAT actually refused to run on a number of, of tests, again getting wildly inconsistent data, ranging from 86 milliseconds of total system input lag to just 11. But in general, it seems to sort of average out around 30 milliseconds, which isn't too bad, although I have seen a little bit better. And OSRTT reported around about 10 milliseconds of total system input lag when using the UE4 test program rather than an actual game where things like animation delays might play a role in delaying the input. So that's the data, but what's it like to actually use and to, to game on? Well, if I can manage to forget the strobing, it's pretty great. And it's, at least in a bright room anyway, it's incredibly vibrant, it's rather stunning to look at, content looks exceptional, and even in a bright room you'll have no trouble seeing absolutely everything. In a darker room, especially in the SDR mode, you will notice the, the glow and the, the sort of limited contrast ratio, but it will still be a, a great viewing experience, again, minus the strobing. For gaming, even more frustratingly, it was excellent. It felt smooth and responsive, the panel was certainly fast enough to give a, a crisp gaming experience, and I was able to feel confident with you know, playing on it incredibly quickly, which isn't something I can say for all monitors. Despite my usual lack of skills, I think it was a little more accurate, especially in the faster paced action where I'm often let down by a, a slow, smeary panel. And that's the most annoying thing, because it only took a few minutes for my eyes to, to be, well, feel strained and to be physically painful, and a few more minutes to get a, a blinding headache and having to, to stop using it. Even if you don't get the, the headaches, this level of flicker is something that monitor manufacturers have been promoting their monitors as being free from. Have you ever heard of flicker free as a, a branding term? Yeah, for a full decade and for good reason. And actually, it's not even like this is just like black frame, frame insertion, which I still personally can't use, but it's, it's actually different because even at RGB 102, 
like out of 255, it pulses to full white every two milliseconds and then immediately to full black. This isn't good for you and it's such a shame. For us, a thousand pound price tag, hell, even a 300 pound price tag, I cannot recommend this monitor. The flicker alone is enough to rule that out completely, but on top of that, the fact that it doesn't do local dimming in SDR, that IPS glow and backlight bleed is far from ideal, and the local dimming zone still being relatively large, would make this a less than ideal choice, even if the strobing wasn't present. Personally, I think if you have this kind of money to spend on a monitor, the ARS FI27Q-X was a much better experience for me, offers an increased 240Hz refresh rate as well, and it's actually a fair bit cheaper. Or I'm sure there are a number of other higher end options that I'm yet to check out that might be just as good or even better. I really wanted this monitor to be great. Mini LED monitors are currently very few and far between, but the technology seems like a, a great stepping stone between OLED and regular LCD displays, which is why it's such a shame that this one isn't great. This is a first generation product though, and AOC have shown over the years that they are committed to, well, improving their products, so I'm really excited to see what a, a second generation uh, or second generation version of this can do. With that said, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the AG274 QXM? Is it a monitor you would pick up yourself? Or is it something that you're gonna steer clear of? Do you just not have the cash for it? Or uh, do you have a, another preference that you'd recommend instead? Feel free to let me know in those comments down below. As always, I will be leaving a link to it in the description down below if you do want to check it out. That will be an Amazon affiliate link that will take you to your local Amazon store. We can check out pricing when we watch this, although at least at the time of filming, it's not very uh, worldwidely available just yet, so that link might not take you to anywhere other than just an Amazon search page. But either way, that's that. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to leave those in the comments down below. If you want to support the channel and me making these videos and uh, all of that sort of stuff, you can do so by hitting the subscribe button and turning on the bell notification icon, or you can support more directly through YouTube itself, through the YouTube join button, or Patreon instead if you'd rather, and get some cool perks for doing so. Or you can pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one, or a load of other designs that I made myself, or there's also a load of other links in the description, places like Overclock UK affiliate links. If you're buying from there, feel free to take a look. And yeah, that's kind of it really. If you want to check out some more videos, I have plenty you can check out, including monitor reviews and content on my open source response time tool that I'm, uh, I've been using in this video and that I'm, I'm hopeful will be uh, you know, available and in other people's hands soon. Uh, so check out those on the end cards. But yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.